Hey guys, I'm Dov, and today I'm back with more Total War Warhammer 2 online action. We're here with the High Elves and the Beastmen, going to be taking a look at another 2v2 with myself and Loremaster Sotek, fighting a couple of opponents on ladder here. This is another one of the matchups that we didn't get to show off in the King of the Tomb final. This was actually our Game 5 army pick. Uh, High Elves and Beastmen, another not super lore friendly match. Uh, but two uh, factions that I think can potentially synergize very well. There's a lot of different ways you can go with this. Uh, both factions have good mobility, decent infantry, although I'd say the Beastmen generally have more cost-effective infantry. Uh, the High Elves tend to have more elite-tier infantry. High Elves, of course, have a strong air force and good magic selection. Uh, Beastmen have no air force whatsoever, but also have a selection of different magics, which are all very good as well. So this is also going to give us an opportunity to take a look at two Lores of Magic today. Uh, I'm going to highlight specifically uh, High Magic here, which you guys have seen quite a bit on my channel, which is why I'm doing it just in a quick video like this. Uh, we've got Apotheosis and Tempest, which is my typical loadout here. Apotheosis is a nice, cheap, cost-effective healing spell, only single target, buzz but does regenerate hit points and cause fear, so very nice. Uh, Tempest, of course, is a vortex that only affects flying units, uh, but it's more like uh, a pin-in-place ability. It's no longer a hard snare, but it is minus 72% speed, and it does a lot of magic damage, especially against single model entities, so uh, very, very useful uh, spell for countering flying units, and considering we're facing the High Elves, and the Dwarves, I thought Flying Units could be a potentiality there. We'll look at the other spells in the Lore of Magic afterwards, but one other thing worth noting here is Lore Attribute, Shield of Safri. So a map-wide 11% damage resistance, which is all types of damage for 9 seconds, which isn't the most, but it is something for 9 seconds. Pretty decent, especially when you spam it with Apotheosis. It's a very cheap spell, and you can get lots of procs out of that Shield of Safri, get some nice damage mitigation. Uh, so we've got the uh, the High Mage, the uh, Prince on the Dragon, another Sun Dragon, we've got two uh, units of Dragon Princes and, Ill and an Illyrian Reaver on this side, and a Mirror over on this side with the High Mage in the center, and one unit of White Lions backing up the Beastman Infantry Core, which is five units of Vestgore Herd, three Ungor Raiders, uh, two Ungor Spearman Herd, make that three, we've also got a Saigor, and a Bray Shaman Lore of Wild. So this is the second... Uh, uh, lore of magic I wanted to highlight today is lore of wild. This is the race specific lore for the beastmen and obviously the spell that you guys will see most often and, and again the reason why I'm going through this one in a kind of quick look video like this is because you'll see it relatively often. It is a very strong lore of magic for the beastmen particularly because you can summon Saigor. So you have two, uh, uh, two potential Saigor summons. That's to only two charges, but it is very expensive at 26 wins of magic, and of course summoned units degrade. Uh, that being said, Saigor is a very powerful monster, can do a lot of damage to uh, very heavily armored infantry uh, at a long range, and is decent in melee, low melee defense, but has quite a bit of armor piercing weapon strength and does cause fear and terror as well. Also gives this uh, map-wide 25% miscast chance, which uh, the natural Saigor is already providing, a summon Saigor won't stack on that but still useful to have. So uh, let's go ahead and kick the battle into full gear as we take a look at our opponent's armies here. They've got a prince on the ground here backed up by a noble, a lore of light caster for the high elves with, on a chariot, which is a very interesting pick. Uh, high, uh, light magic is very useful and we'll go ahead and talk about that on another day. Uh, but we've also got three units of archers here, uh, four white lions, and some cav out to the sides. We've got spearmen here, uh, three units of silver helms with shields, and another unit of spearmen. Then for the dwarf force, we've got an ethereal thane, a dwarf lord, unit of slayers, the uh, dragonback slayers actually, a goblobber, and an organ gun with two bugman's rangers, two units of longbeards, uh, make that three, uh, three units of longbeards, two dwarf warriors, one of which is a warrior's dragon fire pass, Ulthardus raiders, another ethereal thane, and that's pretty much it. So uh, straight off the bat, we're taking a little bit of missile fire here. The Saigor is getting some effective shots on the High Elves, but having taken some damage here with these Dragon Princes, uh, we're going to pull away and immediately just collapse in and Alpha Strike this uh, White Lion here, and then immediately pull over to these Archers and just get a nice charge here. So uh, High Elves taking on High Elves here. It's always a good time. You can see the Beastman Infantry rolling up through the side here. We're going to get a little bit of a mobile engagement underway. These Spearmen are unbraced, so we're just going to get in with a straight-up charge with these Dragon Princes. They'll do a lot of shock damage to a low armor unit like this. 
Meanwhile, over on this side, I'm going to get a little bit caught out with this unit of Valyrian Reavers and get uh, stuck between multiple units of Dragon Princes. Here, I've been netted uh, my Dragon Princes and both Dragons up in the air. Uh, very nicely done with that overcast net of Amontok, catching all of these units in that pocket. It's going to allow these uh, Silver Helms and these Spearmen to charge in and get uh, not allow these Dragon Princes to get their charge bonus. But even still, uh, once these Dragons drop down into combat, we're going to be able to goon uh, this Prince relatively easily. We've also got missile support from the Saigor, so these... Uh, these Silver Helms are going to be taking some serious missile damage. They did get that Fawz Protection buffing their armor and melee defense. 69 melee defense with that Fawz Protection means these Silver, these Silver Helms are going to be seriously tanky, but they will take a lot of damage from that uh, Saigor Missile Fire, of course, and the uh, Dragons as well. Just did an absolute ton of damage to that Prince, and because there's no healing magic for the High Elves here, uh, it is going to be, for the opposing High Elves, I should say, they're not going to be able to heal up that Lord, and he is going to get terrified away. We've been pushing through the center fairly effectively. White Lions, a Bestigal Herd working in tandem, some Chaos Spawn summoned up, and now we're going to start working on the Dwarfs here. Uh, we've been able to get in their back line a little bit with some Illyrian Reavers, uh, and now these, silver, uh, these Dragon Princes that were over on this side also getting through. We've been just kind of maneuvering around, pulling the Dwarf Forces uh, in different directions. The reason they weren't more involved in that mainline engagement is because we had these the Illyrian Reavers over on this side, kind of uh, pinning up and around. Now we're going to get these Dragon Princes in here. They are going to get terrified away, unfortunately, for the from the Ethereal Thane, which is a decent choice, actually, against the High Elves. They, believe it or not, don't have that much single target uh, direct damage. They do have a few different options, but uh, the Ethereal Thanes can potentially be a decent pick in this matchup. You can see them scaring off the uh, Dragon Princes there in tandem with the uh, Dragonback Slayers there. But uh, yeah, in the main line, it's going to be pretty rough. Uh, Best score herd will definitely cleave through Longbeards. It'll take him quite a while. But uh, we've also got, also got uh, Saigors on station providing some missile support as well. Uh, the Noble is getting taken to task pretty well by Morgur. Uh, Morgur, of course, is very tanky. He's got that regeneration. And the Noble is taking a lot of missile fire here from these Ungor Raiders, which, although they aren't armor-piercing missiles, just through sheer volume of fire, they're going to be able to do quite a bit of damage here to, uh, to, to this Noble. Uh, we were able to chase off those uh, those Silver Helms here, beat them down with the Dragon Prince's Superior Cavalry, and uh, with the support of the Dragons, of course. We've got the two uh, Walmart Dragons running around. This one Walmart Dragon is going to come in for a quick charge here on this, uh, this this Noble and just quickly terrify him away, spring Morgur loose. Meanwhile, we're uh, bringing up the High Mage and this other Dragon to support in this mainline engagement. At this point, it's just going to be a matter of grinding the uh, Dwarf Forces down as much as possible. Going to be dropping that Dragon Breath there and uh, <clears throat> dropping then into combat to deal that nice armor piercing damage. Longbeards are a very tanky unit. You can see them uh, holding these Best of War Herds relatively well, allowing these Bugman's Rangers to shoot in the majority of their ammo. It's very cost effective. Uh, in, in general, these Bugman's Rangers. I'm a huge fan, as you guys know. We did get these Dragon Princes to rally, but the important thing is we were able to sh re shut down the artillery for the most part. Uh, the Goblobber's been routed off. The Organ Gun is back online, but only has the crew to man a single gun here. So we've been able to do our jobs for the most part in taking down that artillery. Now it's just a matter of grinding down the Dwarf Center with the uh, Chaos Spawn and with these Dragons and with the... Uh, <clears throat> Best of War Herds as well. You can see only one Best of War Herd is actually still fighting in the pits here, but uh, they're definitely slugging it out. We've got the Ethereal Thanes in here as well. Once we're able to isolate the Ethereal Thanes, it's not going to be so much of an issue, but uh, finishing off the Dwarven leadership, of course, is going to be tough. Dwarfs are a very resolute, uh, proud people. You can see we've got the Dragon in here. Unfortunately, the uh, Ulthar's Raiders have pulled up on station. going to be Hopefully not uh, getting in too much missile fire here, but uh, since these Bugman's Rangers are unbraced, normally they have charged defense against large, but since they're engaged with the dragon, they're unbraced, we're going to get a nice little side charge here with these Dragon Princes. Doesn't do the most damage, but it will do some, and hopefully help terrify some of these guys away. Actually, it looks like those uh, <coughs> those Bugman's Rangers holding, uh, holding stout here, not really wanting to route off, so very nicely done there. But at this point, the... Uh, the Dwarf High Elf Alliance is very far behind on the balance power, bringing over the other Dragon Princes from the far side, who have just been on mop-up duty there. Uh, the uh, High Mage, unfortunately, has taken a lot of damage here, but uh, bringing in the Brace Shaman Lore of Wild, who summoned up another Slygore here, 
just to tilt the balance of power that much further in our favor. And at this point, it's just going to be the Ethereal Fanes uh, left fighting, of course, because they are unbreakable. So we'll go ahead and fast forward as we uh, grind through the rest of this. It's mostly just going to be uh, grinding down those Thanes. And of course, these Bugman's Rangers as well, holding out resolutely to overwhelming amounts of Dragon Princes. But uh, even these Bugman's Rangers at the end of the day are going to rout and run away, leaving only the Ethereal Thanes left to fight. And fight they will for quite a bit longer. Uh, you can see the, uh, the Dragons have enough weapon strength that despite the heavy physical resistance here, we're able to do enough damage over time and without, of course, any other unit models to soak the hits to uh, uh, divvy out the splash damage, as it were. Uh, they are going to eventually get worn down here just through uh, sheer numbers, but uh, yeah. Very well played to our opponents. Fun battle. I don't know that this High Elf uh, Beastman combination is necessarily optimal, but I definitely think it offers some benefits. You get a very powerful flying force, and you can also... The, the advantage that you have is you can go very mobile with both factions. Dragon Princes are one of the fastest elite tier shock cavalry in the game. So you can go very mobile with lots of Dragon Princes, tons of Centigors, with throwing axes, regular Centigors, and with great weapons. And just go that route uh, with, you know, a few Cygors to pull your army, your opponent's army, into different directions. Uh, you, you can go with very heavy flying force from the High Elves to support the ground engagement for the Beastmen. Uh, fun stuff overall, but you can see from the battle breakdown here... <clears throat> The Prince and the Sun Dragon were able to rack up quite a few kills, did some nice work. Uh, Dragon Prince is also, for the most part, did some very nice work as well. Uh, for Lord Master of Sotek here, the Saigor racking up quite a few kills, and the Bestigor slugging it out in the pits. Only one of them picked up a Chevron, but still, they did their jobs uh, there in the center. Uh, for our opposing High Elves here, uh, nice tactics uh, using the Silver Helms and the Magic and so on. Unfortunately, didn't quite have the power to back it up and finish off those Dragon Princes and the Dragons. So ended up being a little bit of a rough engagement. Uh, the fact that the Dwarfs were pulled in different directions was pretty rough. We were able to use our mobility to kind of isolate the two armies and pick them apart one by one. And that definitely worked out to our favor. The dwarf range units definitely got a lot of work done, but just the uh, longbeards didn't end up paying off in the center. The slayers, though, <laughs> 98 kills, some serious work done there. So, fun battle. Hope you guys enjoyed watching. Let's go ahead and just briefly take a look here <clears throat> at both these lores of magic. So, <clears throat> in terms of the lore of high magic here for the high elves and for the lizardmen, they're the only two that can access it. The high elves, of course, with the uh, high mage here. And the lizard men with the dreaded uh, Sherbert Salon here that you guys know I'm a huge fan of. So uh, Apotheosis we looked at as well as Tempest. Uh, Hand of Glory is an interesting one. It gives melee attack and reload skill. It is cheap, so it's another way to spam that Shield of Safri if you want. And 26 melee attack does decent little buff there. 40 reload skill can be decent as well. Soul Quench uh, is a magic missile, which I personally haven't used too much. I'm not the biggest fan of magic missile spells. But it can do some damage uh, in terms of magic missiles. It's uh, one of the better ones, I would say. Arcane Unforging is a spell I'll take occasionally. It does some decent uh, direct damage to single characters uh, specifically. And also gives them plus 30 ability recharge, which can be very, very useful in certain situations. Especially if you're facing a, a hero that has an item that requires melee to recharge. For example, Arcane the Black's... Uh, Tomb Blade that gives an area of effect healing to the Tomb Kings uh, it does require him to be in melee to recharge. So, for example, if you cast this before the battle starts, he's not going to be able to then use that Tomb Blade until he gets into melee long enough to recharge it. So, it can potentially be very useful. Also, does some decent direct damage. So, against someone like an Ethereal Thane, for example, in the matchup we just played, it would have been very useful to have that on Arcane and Forging. Fiery Convocation is a wind spell that's probably one of the worst wind spells in the, in the game, in my opinion. It doesn't do that much damage, and it has a super long cast time. Like, super long, very, very easy to dodge. Uh, one of the easiest spells in the game to dodge if you're paying attention, because it has a long cast time and a very long animation as well. So I would hope that uh, maybe Creative Assembly at some point would look at either buffing the, uh, <clears throat> the cast time, lowering the cast time, or else uh, just speeding up the animation so it plays a little bit faster. But that's neither here nor there. That's uh, Lore of High Magic for you. Really, the, uh, the spells I recommend are Apotheosis, Tempest, if you think you're facing flying units, and Arcane and Forging. The other spells are more just for fun. 
and now the second lore of magic we were looking at is for the beastmen. Now you will see me take uh, lore of wild almost every time. The Saigor summon, of course, is very powerful, particularly if you take Malagor, who can get more wins of magic, being that he has the arcane conduit ability. Um, <clears throat> File Tide is a nice cheap explosion spell, good against low armor, and a nice way of refreshing the lore attribute for Lore of Wild, which is this Bestial Surge here. A map wide 18% uh, charge bonus and 9% vigor, which the 18% charge bonus in and of itself can be pretty good uh, right at the beginning of the battle. The 9% vigor is also uh, potentially very nice in the late stage when your troops are tired. Um, actually, throughout the battle, if you're just continuously excuse me, spamming these cheap buff spells are these cheap uh, cheap spells in general like uh, Vile Tide. Bray Scream is only five wins of magic. It's a targeted uh, breath spell. It has a very wide uh, cone of attack rather than some of the more narrow ones. Uh, Devolve is a direct damage area of effect. Good against multi-combatant units whereas uh, Traitor Kin is going to be good against uh, low model count units specifically like cavalry and so on also gives a speed debuff where devolve gives a leadership debuff so both these direct damage spells are pretty decent vile tides a nice cheap explosion good against low armor same with the brave scream it's good against low armor mantle of garok is a very kind of niche uh, buff spell but very very powerful only 11 wins of magic as well so it's relatively cheap in that aspect but it's a single target 44 melee attack which is huge 40% AP and 40% weapon damage, which again is massive at the cost of minus 30 armor. But when you think that uh, most Beastman units tend to have relatively low armor anyway, it doesn't really cost that much to tear an additional 30 off. You think of something like a Minotaur, for example. Uh, <clears throat> you, got, you give these guys extra 44 melee attack and tons of extra weapon damage. It's going to be huge on them. So uh, potentially very useful buff spell. You don't see it brought too often, but it is a nice spell. Uh, the Saigor summon is where people usually end up dumping their magic with this particular lore, just because Saigors are a very powerful unit right now, right now. so is worth noting. So that's uh, my discussion for lore of high magic and the lore of wild today. Um, let me know your guys' thoughts in the comments down below. I know we're going to be getting to some of the other race-specific lores as soon as I get the chance to record some footage. I've been super busy with work this week, so I haven't had a chance to play too many battles. But uh, come uh, Sunday afternoon, I'll be off for the weekend, and then we can jump into some battles and hopefully record you guys some footage of, like, uh, the two Skaven lores. We're going to be looking at the Greenskin lores and, of course, lore of vampires as well and the Tomb Kings. Well, lots of lores of magic to look through, so stay tuned for more, and we'll see you next time.